the former Lord Chief Justice um, three or four years ago, our laws of contempt of court are designed to prevent the media from interfering with the due process of justice by making it more difficult to conduct a fair trial. That is the essential principle. Um, so far as contempt of court is concerned, the rules which govern the limitations on the media in the context of the trial process. The position relating to the media is one of strict liability. In other words, there need be no deliberate interference with the course of justice um, for an offence under the contempt of court provisions to have been committed. An offence is committed if, an, if there has been an act or a mission calculated to interfere with the due administration of justice. So once that act or remission has occurred, the offence is committed whether or not um, the journalist, media, organisation has proceeded with any intent. That's why, of course, it's in effect an offence of strict liability. The strict liability rules apply in relation to any publication, speech, writing, programme or other communication addressed to the public at large and um, at all times during the proceedings when they are active the limitations apply. That is until acquittal or sentence in the course of criminal proceedings. And some examples of circumstances which apply generally are where a defendant's previous convictions are reported, where um, someone is referred to in the media as a burglar rather than an alleged burglar, where images of the jury are captured, that type of situation gives rise to contempt proceedings and st serious consequences. There are few statutory defences to the charge, um, one of them being innocent, the principal one being innocent distribution, that is a distributor of a publication but at the time of the distribution, having taken all reasonable care, does not know that it contains potentially prejudicial material, then that's a defence to contempt um, proceeding and the principal defence. But it's not easy to establish, and it has to be established by the defendant on a balance of probabilities. The third point in relation to contempt proceedings I bring to your attention is section 4.2 of the contempt provisions which gives the court power to order the postponement of a report where it, need, where it feels it necessary to do so to avoid a substantial risk of prejudice to the administration of justice. In other words, this is a preemptive strike which judges, certainly in London, often implement, which gives the judge, a trial judge, power to restrict publicity in advance of a trial, provided the judge is satisfied that a substantial risk to the administration of justice needs to be avoided. Um, and that, of course, is an important inroad to the essential pr principle of open justice. Um, there is also power for the judge to restrict publication, such as publication of names of persons involved in a criminal trial. There are special limitations with regard to children. But if that limitation is imposed, it has to extend to the trial process itself. In other words, where, where there is a limitation as to the identity of witnesses um, in a case, then the jury as well as the public are, um, are, 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 are uh, prevented from hearing of that information. There is power for a judge to stop a criminal trial from taking place on the ground of undue sensational publicity. I'm using loose language because of the pressure of time. But it is open to the defence to what Malfoy is called an abusive process application, and it's often done in high-profile cases in which the judge has power to take the view in advance of the commencement of the trial that the publicity which is attached to the imminent trial is so unanswerable that the jury can't possibly reach a fair um, verdict. The most recent and important case in this respect is the case of the Crown against Abu Hamza, who was a high-profile Muslim preacher 
um, convicted in due course of six counts of soliciting to murder, um, who had received um, enormous publicity for his activities over a period of years in highly sensational terms, was then prosecuted and it was argued on his behalf that a fair trial was impossible. So you could see the dilemma. On the one hand, very serious criminal activity with extremely, um, uh, with language of extreme insightful nature. On the other hand, um, sensational publicity over a period of years, which it was said, and on one view correctly, rendered a fair trial impossible. And again, when Lord Phillips was Lord Chief Justice in direction from the judge to the effect that the jury must ignore the publicity, and you will have your own views, of course, about whether that is a realistic a solution to weeks, sometimes months, of sensational publicity. Finally, I conclude, having, uh, I hope, speedily moved through this uh, quagmire of provisions, which in themselves probably could have um, consumed the day of this conference's valuable time, um, simply to highlight the, the manner in which the world of electric communications is being addressed within the United Kingdom. Because it's all well and good, of course, for a judge to um, direct a jury to ignore media publicity or for a, a journalist to be prosecuted for a breach of the contempt provisions. But when a member of the jury switches on the internet, um, or accesses the internet, there are, of course, these days, amateur journalists across the whole world. And that is why the Attorney General, when he recently took office, observed that his most time-consuming activity was to grapple with the problem of publicity in the, the, the um, world of electric communications because the extent of exposure of information is obviously so much greater than when the contempt rules first came about in common law and later in statutory form. So there it is. In the United Kingdom, we, as in every other free country, hoping that fair trials are impossible, have to strike the correct balance between fairness and open justice, so far as the media are concerned, and the overriding requirement for a fair trial. It's believed that that is done by strict contempt rules and strong judicial direction. I have to say, personally, I don't agree, but um, that's only included in this session. Thank you for coming to speak. I'll just take a few minutes. In fact, uh, when we are talking about the freedom of the press, one aspect which we have not discussed is the issue of paid news, that is corruption in media. and. Uh, this is known to the public at large and there have been cases and this paid news occurs in various forms, in the forms of ads and during the election time you have these uh, private channels which are being run by the real estate agents promoting the, uh, the, the, uh, in fact promoting the, generating goodwill for the paid uh, uh, political uh, parties and candidates who are contesting the election. So this is a very serious uh, kind of a threat which uh, is posing to the uh, democracy. And uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the legal, what is the legal framework do we have when you talk about the press law? Professor Shiv Kumar talked about the Press Council of India. Now this statutory body of Press Council of India, is it adequate? to kind of uh, to initiate uh, or take action against the delinquent uh, journalists after investigation? It is no. We all know that the Press Council of India is not even a paper tiger. First of all, it just covers the print media. It does not cover the audio-visual media. And we find in India that there is a large proliferation of the audio-visual media. And please remember, that the, it's the audiovisual media, the print media in India which has the right to criticize all the institutions in a democracy, <coughs> be it the judiciary, the legislature, the executive. So the role of media is very, very critical and important. And the media not only criticizes, it influences the minds of the people. So that's a very, very important aspect. But coming back to the Press Council of India, does it have the power? Now, first of all, it does not cover the audiovisual print media. 
So the Press Council of India needs to be amended to include the audiovisual media as well. B. The Press Council of India can only, after investigation, can, you know, uh, send that uh, case, you know, and make recommendation to the editor of the consent uh, newspaper. Please take action against such and such journalists. <coughs> now it depends on the editor what to do. In some case, there was a case of an editor of a national daily, a very reputed uh, journal, uh, journalist, editor Mr. H.K. Dua. In his case, when the, uh, when the notice was sent to the national daily, the national daily refused to even come to attend the, uh, to attend the, uh, uh, the, the hearings of the Press Council of India. So I think the Press Council of India needs to be strengthened, both in terms of resources, in terms of manpower, and amending the Press Council of India Act to include the audiovisual print media, B, the power to impose penalty should be with the Press Council of India. This power to impose penalty should not be left to the editors of the National Daily. So this is a very, very important point which must, we must keep in mind. Number two, you see what is happening is, now a lot of these, our National Dailies and or the, both the audiovisual print media, they are being owned by the private sector and it has become a commercial, it has become a commercial proposition. Therefore, the editors of the National Daily, we should, you know, we should make a point and we should ask them to please put up on the website their shares, what shares do they own, in which company the shares are owned. Recently, the CB has issued directions in this regard to the, to, the, uh, to the newspaper that please tell us what are the shares of this company. Quite often, the National Dailies get, you know, shares of the company and they promote those companies. This is happening particularly with the business newspaper. <laughs> so it's a very, very important aspect that I think there is a need. In fact, you see, if you have too many laws to regulate the press, uh, this will not be a kind of a good state of affairs. We have to strike a balance. That's very, very important. So I have these two points which are very important. And the last point, if you look at the way our journalists function, the way our both the print media, the way it functions, we do not have specialization. And this is a problem in other institutions of democracy and this is a problem also with the press. Today you are covering the legal uh, beat, tomorrow you are sent to cover the um, NCD beat, the next day you are uh, covering the Ministry of Company Affairs and you see there is a need for specialization even within the <coughs> press. So these are my three comments. Thank you very much for allowing me to be an intruder for three minutes. Thank you. Regarding the idea particularly, one thing I want <coughs> not to uh, derive on something, but one thing comes to my mind, which I want to share with Mr. Mahesh and many upcoming scholars of the Constitution, particularly who are here, that so far as a student of uh, Constitution, I have studied the freedom of speech guaranteed in favor of citizen. I have never came across a law in Indian constitution which gives any special status to a group like press. Constitution does not acknowledge any right, a special right, what is already guaranteed to the individual citizens. Right of freedom, speech and expression is right of every citizen. And press also enjoys the same rights. But being a organized group, they hold the entire society, rather nation, to for a ransom. They put everybody to come to their own terms. And sometimes it becomes very much detrimental to the interest of the society itself. Let us talk about the point raised by Professor Shukuma. He said that in uh, Nira Radia case, this to the spectrum uh, 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 scam was exposed by media very rightly. But at the same time, these tapes indicates and reveals that certain people in media and certain third grade people running something, uh, what should I call that will 